for example, when I um, describe the Greek act, you, you know, I was born in Greece and we have a summer home and I was having coffee with my parents in the afternoon and I saw chickens eating purslane. And purslane is a wild plant that when I was at the NIH, I had studied and it has the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids. Mm. But I never knew or no one had described that purslane is a source of food for the chickens. My father said to me, of course they need to, the chickens need to eat purslane because if they don't eat purslane, they don't really make eggs. Hmm. There are factors in the purslane. In any event, when I came back to the NIH, I, I brought these eggs from Greece that they were boiled so they can go through customs without any problem. And to my surprise, when I compare the composition of the Greek egg to that of the egg from the Department of Agriculture, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in the Greek egg, it was one, balanced, whereas that of the agriculture was about 12 to 1. And mm. then later on, as we did more and more, it averaged up to about 20 to 1. So that it's not only, you know, the protein and carbohydrate, the amounts, it's to look at the ingredients that make up the food supply and understand their metabolism. And I think whenever a, a new product is developed, you have to be certain as to what kind of changes take place. For example, in the ultra-processed foods, they have very little in common from what you find in real food. So if you want to think of the diets, you have to think in terms of the evolution, what it was, the changes that have taken place, the importance of the inflammatory components of these diets, the importance of the ratio, 